Hi everyone. Welcome to KSL 2021 and 25th year anniversary of KSL. This is a virtual congress in this year. I call this virtual congress, uh, it's not untagged, it's a uh, untagged, online plus untagged. So this untagged virtual congress will be have a good uh, chance to develop our uh, laparoscopic knowledge and uh, skill. This time, um, we have our four speakers to, for the uh, Symposium 8 HVP session. The title is Conference Preparation for Safe, Minimally Invasive Liberal Section. Um, I am chair of this session. Uh, this is the Hee Liu from Jambung National University Hospital, Korea. My co-chair is uh, Chi Young Jung from Gyeongsang National University Hospital in Korea. I will introduce the first two speakers and my co-chair will be moderate as two speakers. Our first speaker is Yang Song Mi from Seoul National University Hospital, Korea. Uh, she uh, presents anesthetic consideration in minimal invasive liver resection. After is after her uh, presentation, we will accept uh, Q&A session. Please start video, click. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to be invited here and I would like to express my thanks. I am Song Mi Yang, an anesthesiologist from Seoul National University Hospital. My topic is anesthetic considerations in minimally invasive liver resection. I do not have any conflicts of interest. I will be presenting in this order, advantages and characteristics of laparoscopic liver surgery, preoperative risk assessment, anesthetic considerations, especially about positioning, low CVP, pneumoperitoneum and CO2 gas embolism, which will be the main part of this session. And then I will introduce a case with severe CO2 embolism and wrap up the story. I am sure that all of you already know the advantages of minimally invasive liver resections and that with increasing improvements and developments of new technology, more centers are implementing laparoscopic surgery as a therapeutic strategy for liver tumors. The important characteristics of laparoscopic liver surgery include assessment of the comorbidities of the patient, reverse Trendelenburg positioning during the operation, which can lead to hypotension, risk of bleeding due to the liver parenchymal transection and numerous and large hepatic veins, and the risk of gas embolism due to the entrapment of CO2 into the hepatic veins to the IBC and into the heart, leading eventually to RV and LV failure. I will discuss in more detail about the strategies to overcome these risks. Intraoperatively, the early pre-transection phase of the operation done laparoscopically, shown in the blue line, has more opportunities for difficulties with anesthesia related to establishment of pneumoperitoneum and in patients with low CVP compared to open surgery, which is shown in the dotted red line. As with all surgeries, preoperative assessment is important. The spectrum of patients undergoing laparoscopic liver resection ranges from young healthy patients presenting for liver donors to high-risk patients with advanced liver cirrhosis and other medical comorbidities. It is important to consider the interaction of patient comorbidities and functional status with anesthetic techniques and surgical factors, including the extent of liver resection, pneumoperitoneum, and blood loss. It is important to understand the cardiovascular system of cirrhotic patients. Usually these patients are in a hyperdynamic circulation state, which includes low total peripheral resistance, splanchnic vasodilation, central hypovolemia, and increased cardiac output. Many of these patients have ascites-induced shortness of breath, 
arterial hypoxemia due to intrapulmonary vascular shunts, and portal hypertension, which limits the exercise capacity and masks demand-inducible ischemia. Because of the physiologic stress induced by the operation, stress echocardiography is needed to risk stratify patients from low to high risk. Regarding the anesthetic considerations, laparoscopic liver resection is usually done under general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation. Routine monitoring with a continuous A line is usually needed. An additional large or intravenous line or a central line is placed as well because of the bleeding risk of the surgery. The decision for a central line placement depends on the experience of the anesthesia team, the magnitude of the liver resection, and group dynamics between the operation and the anesthesia team. Abdominal insufflation causes hemodynamic changes, increasing stress on the cardiovascular system. The legs usually are placed in stirrups, and steep reverse Trendelenburg positioning also is used to facilitate access to the liver. To prevent the patient from sliding downward during the reverse Trendelenburg position, straps across the patient's chest and thighs are placed. This position in laparoscopic liver resection exacerbates the cardiac function fluctuation. Therefore, the pneumoperitoneal pressure should be increased gradually, and the increase of the angle of the reverse Trendelenburg position should also be increased gradually. Current research has shown that CVP is not reflective of central blood volume and is not used to guide fluid therapy. The term here, low CVP, actually refers to minimizing caval distension in order to reduce hepatic venous bleeding during liver resections because bleeding risk is highest during the parenchymal transection. Therefore, the anesthesiologist, first of all, will limit fluid administration to the minimum necessary to maintain appropriate hemodynamics until parenchymal transection is complete. Intravenous nitroglycerine can also be used with vasoactive agents. Many centers use minimally invasive hemodynamic monitoring, such as stroke volume variation, to guide volume responsiveness and hemodynamic optimization, eliminating the need for central venous access. Pneumoperitoneum offers a theoretical technical advantage in laparoscopic liver resections in that the CO2 insufflation may reduce hepatic venous back bleeding. Reducing airway pressure is an additional effective measure for controlling bleeding from the hepatic vein in addition to measures such as increasing pneumoperitoneum pressure. However, under low airway pressure, the risk of pulmonary gas embolism increases when pneumoperitoneum pressure is greater than CVP. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is the most commonly used gas for insufflation and can cause hypertemnia, metabolic acidosis, cardiorespiratory compromise, and greater postoperative pain. CO2 embolism is a rare but potentially serious complication of laparoscopic procedures. CO2 entrapped in an injured vein can result in the blockage of the right ventricle and pulmonary artery. Clinical signs depend on the volume of the embolized gas and can result in severe cardiovascular collapse. The incidence of clinically significant carbon dioxide embolism is rare, less than 1%. But the incidence of any kind of carbon dioxide embolism is varied depending on the method of detection. And the reported mortality of carbon dioxide embolism is very high, about 28%. The physiologic changes resulting from CO2 embolism are decreased PaO2, PaCO2, decreased pH, increased pulmonary artery pressure and right ventricular failure, and then resulting in decreased cardiac output and left ventricular failure. Transesophageal echography, TEE, is the most sensitive method for detecting subclinical intravenous CO2 as small as 0.1 milliliters per kilogram, but it is not routinely used in liver resections. As mentioned above, TEE 
is a highly sensitive method for detecting CO2 embolism. However, since TEE is not usually placed routinely in liver surgeries, during routine monitoring of laparoscopic liver resections, we can see a sudden decrease or loss of endotidal CO2 or an abrupt rise. And as there is strain on the heart, we will see changes in the ECG. This is an important slide for anesthesiologists and actually the most important aspect is communication with the surgeon. Because for the prevention, we would recommend the use of low insufflation pressure and not to decrease the CVP below the intraperitoneal pressure. At many high volume centers, laparoscopic hepatectomy is performed at a pneumoperitoneal pressure less than 12 millimeters of mercury. When CO2 embolism is suspected, once again, it is important to inform the surgeon in order to prevent further gas entry. The rest of the resuscitation should be managed by the anesthesiologist with adequate hydration and inotropes and etc. as seen in this table. This article is about the optimal pneumoperitoneal pressure for laparoscopic major hepatectomy and the conclusion stated that at many high volume centers, a pneumoperitoneal pressure less than 12 millimeters of mercury was used and that at this pressure, the rate of clinically severe gas embolism was low. This is an animal study regarding the frequency and severity of gas embolism in laparoscopic liver resection in pigs. In 10 out of 15 piglets, a total of 33 separate episodes of gas embolism occurred, and of those, 16 were serious to cause not only respiratory but also hemodynamic effects. This is a report of massive CO2 embolism during laparoscopic hepatectomy for a right-sided liver tumor. The pneumoperitoneal pressure was set at 15 millimeters of mercury, and during liver parenchymal transection, endotidal CO2 increased to 60, and PaCO2 was checked to be 68.7, which was caused by rupture of the hepatic vein. Transesophageal echo, shown in the upper right quadrant, showed gas bubbles in the heart. Postoperatively, the patient had reduced muscular power in the left upper extremity, severe pleural effusion, and hypoalbuminemia, which was due to the increase in pulmonary vascular permeability caused by the CO2 embolism. Fortunately, this patient fully recovered after treatment in the ICU. In this case report, there was a sudden decrease in endotidal CO2 and ST elevation and depression was shown in the ECG. Surgery was continued after these changes were improved. However, Postoperatively, incomplete right paralysis was present, and MRI revealed cerebral infarction in the left cerebral cortex. In this case, the intra-abdominal pressure was maintained at 10 millimeters of mercury, and CVP was adjusted to maintain about 5 millimeters of mercury. This is one case that I want to share of severe CO2 embolism which shows the physiologic changes that I have mentioned above. The video shown in the next slide is played seven times faster just to show the major events. A 61-year-old male is undergoing laparoscopic right hemihepatectomy and after dissection of the liver plane, injury to the right hepatic vein occurs. The anesthesiologist notices the bleeding and first of all starts to load fluids. At first, the vital signs are maintained and only a rise in the end tidal CO2 is seen. At this time, in order to control the bleeding, the surgeon increases the pneumoperitoneal pressure. Then we see a drop in the saturation and the anesthesiologist increases the fraction of inspiratory oxygen, first to 0.6 and then to 1.0. The blood pressure is somewhat maintained in this period but we can see changes in the arterial waveform showing a low pulse pressure indicating low cardiac output. 
the anesthesiologist requests to convert to open surgery because the vital signs start to deteriorate. The position is changed to level, and although the heart is giving contractions, there is almost no cardiac output. The end tidal CO2 starts to decrease, and the heart rate slows down as well. And all of a sudden, we have an arrest situation. While converting to open surgery, the anesthesiologist requests cardiac compressions, and this is the arterial blood gas analysis at this point. The patient is not only acidic, but also you can see an increase in the PaCO2, which shows a number of 83. The ECG rhythm has changed and one milligram of epinephrine is given while chest compressions are continuously done. The end tidal CO2 had dropped all the way down to 12, but here we can see a slight rise in the ETCO2, indicating a return of cardiac output. And the ECG, the rhythm, returns to a sinus rhythm. we also see a return of an arterial waveform. The bleeding focus was found and ligated. And here we have a return to spontaneous circulation. This patient very fortunately was discharged without any complications. All of these events happened within 10 minutes, which was a nightmare for all of us but early detection and management was able to save this patient. The key elements for good outcome are careful patient selection and risk stratification, vigilant monitoring of the surgical field and vital signs, techniques to reduce blood loss and transfusion, early detection and management of events during the operation, and most important of all, optimized communication and team dynamics between the surgeon and anesthesiologist. To summarize this topic, laparoscopic liver resection can have a significant burden on the hemodynamic status of the patient. The incidence of CO2 embolism is low but can lead to severe complications. Anesthesiologists are monitoring not only the vital signs, but the laparoscopic monitor vigilantly because events can occur in just seconds. Please do not hesitate to convert to open surgery when vital signs become unstable. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the uh, very informative lecture about the uh, anesthetic management during the laparoscopic liver resection. Um, Professor uh, uh, Song Mi Yang is lying here. Uh, thank you very much for your nice lecture. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, there is no um, uh, question from the uh, uh, online uh, um, members, uh, but I have uh, one, uh, just two simple questions. Uh, in your presentation, you showed, uh, you introduced some cerebral infarction after the uh, laparoscopic surgery. Uh, I think uh, this infarction, cerebral infarction is not related to the CO2 embolism, but uh, in your lecture, uh, it, uh, this cerebral infarction induced by uh, uh, CO2 embolism like that. So what is your opinion? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, actually, I, I should have um, explained a little more uh, deeply because um, because this is actually a case of a paradoxical embolism. Uh, actually, uh, an embolism resulting from, let's say, from liver resection should uh, go through the right heart and mostly be uh, dissolved in the lungs and should not go to the left heart, which of course, which in our infarction uh, 
patient, it, it went to the to the left heart and and eventually to uh, leading to cerebral infarction. But um, uh, that's why in this in that case report, uh, they emphasized the the need for an a, a trans uh, uh, an echocardiography to make sure that there is no uh, small ASD or VSD in a patient. Uh, I, to make sure that there is no uh, shunt, there is no uh, any kind of shunt for these patients. Actually, for that case, they are not sure why that that would have happened because this patient did not show uh, any kind of of uh, ASD or VSD. So they also um, question that part in the discussion. But uh, they also um, mentioned that there might have that maybe the infarction, uh, the infarcted, uh, infarcted air was a large infarction, which, which passed the pulmonary and went to the left heart, but they cannot um, conclude which, what exactly uh, made that kind of cerebral infarction. Yeah, thank you for your nice uh, answer about uh, my question. And also, uh, if there, uh, when you have a, a severe massive uh, CO2 embolism during the laparoscope surgery, it relates to the rupture of the hepatic vein. If, if the hepatic vein is not open, the CO2 embolism is not, uh, amount is not uh, massive. So, uh, um, uh, in your conclusion, and you showed uh, a nightmare case about uh, case, uh, you made a, a cardiac, uh, cardiac resuscitation also. And in these cases, um, you have to communicate to the, together. Anesthesiologist and the surgeon should communicate each other and to uh, explain the, and to uh, constant to warning about the patient situation and operation. Uh, breathing situation or so yeah yes yes uh, it, that is actually my conclusion the the most important part is communication with the surgeon and the anesthesiologist and um this and of course um i tried my best to to uh, inform the surgeon of of this uh, of this event but uh, of course uh, because it was just almost uh, almost the transaction was almost finished so uh, I think the surgeon wanted to to just just uh, keep that bleeding down, and uh, and so uh, he wanted he increased the pneumoperitoneal pressure a little bit, but then that resulted in more in more CO2 embolism, and then the bleeding was not was not able to to be um, to be dissolved. But in, eventually we 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 converted to open surgery. And uh, thankfully, the patient was was able to discharge safely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your nice lecture and uh, answer. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We'll move to next uh, next speaker. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'll introduce the next uh, title. Next title is application of 3D printing technology as a surgical guidance in minimal invasive liver surgery. Uh, this title uh, uh, or slow but ongoing progress toward augmenting of the surgeon's insight. This title will be presented by uh, Jin Sul Liu from uh, Samsung Medical Center, Sanggyungan University School of Medicine, Korea. Uh, he's a professor of Samsung Medical Center in Korea. Um, uh, he will present. Uh, let's start his video clip. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jinsu Ru. I work in Samsung Medical Center, and I am a liver surgeon who also do transplantation. I would like to introduce my experience in using 3D printing in the field of liver surgery, focusing on its future perspective on minimal invasive surgery. I am also a biomedical artist who also draw a medical cartoon. This short cartoon is about 3D printing on our daily lives. Of course, it is an imaginary story, but I want to emphasize the new technology spreading into the society. Currently, I am running a 3D imaging and printing lab, a very small research team. 
reduced 3D imaging and printing, and extended it to VR in deep learning. Basically, we do biomedical art, and my employee here is actually a biomedical artist like myself. We are cooperating with Animated Solution, VR Ad, and Radiology Department for our project. To confess, I am not an engineer and I cannot model or print 3D models by myself. I can do 3D modeling based on DICOM data using software and Mimics Medical, but I have a very basic understanding on 3D printing. So, that enables me to communicate with my artists who actually do all the work. And for the audiences of this lecture who may be surgeons just as I am, I think you can run on 3D printing lab just like I am doing right now. So this is the classification of 3D printing which I will skip. This is the basic concept of FDM and SLA. FDM can print a very light version of 3D models and it is cheap, does not require special facility, but it has a lot of error during the process and some limitations. SLA and SLS can be a better option for durable models, but needs additional equipment. So this is the printer that we have right now. The FDM printer on the left is about $3,000 and SLA printer on the right is around $2,500. Currently, we use mostly FDM because it is more, more easy to use. As a surgeon who needs the most practical approach on every measure, we have to think 3D printing as an extension of 3D modeling. 2D images on 2D platform, which is the conventional PAC system, can only allow a specialized person to use and understand it. But if you make it in 3D, you can see it in a computer and many beginners are allowed to understand it. Putting it in a 3D platform, which is a VR technology, will give you additional experience on understanding the depths of the structures. 3D printed model will give you experience in seeing the inner structure in reality. So theoretically, 3D printing is the best to be used, but in reality, it is hard to print a model, time, effort, money. It is impossible to cover all the surgical cases that you operate with only one engineer and one printer. VR also requires additional working for like three to four hours. Therefore, I usually only do 3D modeling for explaining to the patients. VR and 3D printing is performed only on special cases. When we do quick search, we can see that 3D printing is used in implantable devices, surgical guide, which needs direct contact to the patient, surgical simulator, which enables pre-op training of individual cases. So you can actually perform surgical procedure on the printed model or only enhance your understanding of the case. Implantable 3D printing is used popularly in dentistry. This can be done in dental clinic base. 3D printing is also loved in maxillofacial surgery. Maxillofacial surgery handles bone which can accurately print it because it's a bone. And the surgery is not minimal invasive surgery. You directly contact the surgical field. The 3D printed mandible is about 99% accurate so making a prosthesis based on it will be very accurate. This figure is published in scientific report as a surgical guide during breast surgery. Based on the 3D data, you remodel the uh, patient's breast and make a surgical guide. Based on the guide, you, you uh, make uh, preoperatively planned uh, points to be uh, operated and this is the final version that you have to operate, including the tumors. And this article describes surgical simulation on congenital heart disease like VSD. This disease entity is well investigated for the use of 3D printing and the national insurance also covers using 3D printing on congenital heart disease surgery simulation. So in abdominal surgery, I think it can be advantageous in immobile organs like liver, kidney, spleen, aorta, and arteries. Because vascular structures are the best to be reconstructed in 3D when you perform contrast in CT or MRI, but gastrointestinal organs, it is impossible to model the structure. But since I am a liver surgeon, I'll show you this article and reviews other studies published on 3D printing. You can see that there are many case studies. The cost of the models per dollars, uh, they are actually very expensive if you don't use an FDM printer. This study is from Cleveland Clinic, initial experience on 3D printing. My conclusion of the case report was, wow, it is accurate. The case is, uh, they are really artistic, 
statistically done and you, when you compare it to the actual graft and the recipient uh, liver it is really accurate and very artistically done this is a Japan experience they produce a light version of the liver it looks like a good idea but they use an industrial printer if, if we print that in FDM printer we need lots of supporter if you print it as one object it needs several parts and needs to be re reassembled of which a lot of errors are expected but when you actually plan the surgery based on this it looks very nice since parenchyme are easy to imagine based on the pillars outside and you can actually see in th inside and other studies I will only show you this picture because they are similar and time limitation usually they reconstructed uh, liver cancers and vascular structures and sometimes also liver parenchymes are uh, printed with resin or silicon before starting to present my experience in 3d printing I would like to say that the strength of 3d printing is that it allows precise reconstruction of its organs into reality but utilizing the strength of 3d printing into real world medicine is up to the creative innovators and cooperation of medical practitioners and engineers is essential this is quoted by myself so 3d printing is just a tool how to use it is solely up to the surgeons my short experience in 3d printing can be classified as four categories 3d printing of anatomical structures basically for understanding the anatomy 3d printing assisted patient specific y-shaped radio pack silicon stent which is a national grant project but it's not related to minimal invasive surgery so I will only introduce the concept 3d printed abdominal cavity of the liver transplanted recipient which will only be introduced and 3d printed surgical guide for liver resection to be honest number four is done after I was chosen as a speaker of this session I was trying to find new implementation of 3d printing and just made an idea and did it previously this article was published on clinical translation. It is basically focusing on image guidance program and 3D printing is introduced in the figure. We printed the donor's hyalur anatomy which is used for guidance during surgery but as you know the surgeon who operated is a master of laparoscopic donor hepatectomy so we did not do additional case for ordinary donors. This case with a laparoscopic right posterior graft based on CT and MRI, the right posterior hepatic duct crawls over the right anterior portal vein and meets the right posterior portal vein from behind the right anterior portal vein. So we made a print on the hyalur structure. These pictures show other views of the relationship of the structure and this picture is the view that we will have during laparoscopy. So you can see that right anterior glisten going up and right posterior portal vein getting into the right posterior section which is encircled by blue rubber shot and right posterior hepatic duct is getting into the right posterior section from the right anterior glisten and it is encircled by a silk thread. After cutting it you can see the right posterior hepatic duct pouring out bile juice. Now I will show what I call Kentley model. It is a multiple ACC case and the 3D model adjusted for a tumor located near Kentley's line. It is a 50 year old male patient with a big tumor on segment 4 and an intrapodic metastasis on a very difficult location just above the right anterior glisten pedicle. In the 3D model the liver is not in a good shape. The left liver is about half the total volume. The large tumor is on the left side and a small tumor is just on the right side and RFA, RT were not feasible for this one. So I made a 3D printed model focusing on the shift after left hemihepatectomy. We don't need the other part of the right lobe so we are actually interested in the location of the middle hepatic vein, right anterior glisten and the tumor on the surface of the liver. So you can see what we are watching here is the actual architecture that we designed for 3D printing. So 3D printing was done, you can see it uh, colored afterwards. After performing left hemihepatectomy, we brought in the 3D model. 
we compare the liver with the 3D printed model and after digging with the direction guided by the model we found a small tumor just like a single piece of corn. In this picture this is the middle hepatic vein right glisten and there's the tumor and you can compare it to the 3D printed model. It's very similar. The patient underwent a juvenile proton beam therapy on the tumor bed and it's been nine months with no recurrence. Another case with country model, 50 years old female patient with several metastases on the right and single one on the left near the country line. The patient previously underwent right hemicolectomy with duodenal wedge resection and gastrojejunostomy. Initially, we planned to perform a laparoscopy in case of adhesion is minimal. However, severe adhesion was encountered and we performed open surgery with VATS right middle lobe lobectomy for lung metastasis. We set the surgical plane on a little bit toward left to transect the liver with the small nodule on the left. You can see that in the specimen, the tip of the left the specimen is toward the left side. By this picture, you can see the middle hepatic vein draining into the IBC, just like the 3 printed model, and exposed on the transection surface. Last case was a 40 years old male patient with multiple metastases. I planned to perform left hemihepatectomy with wedge resection of the right tumor. The problem lying on the right was the nodule located near the midline. It was very deeply located and very small, so RFA was not suitable for this case. To see if I can perform additional tumorectomy on the nodule, I plan to do another printing with the country model. I thought it was possible to do it, but the colorectal surgeon decided to start neojuvin chemotherapy and printing was postponed. So these cases were open surgery. I will now introduce a laparoscopic case. It was a 44 years old male patient with an ACC on segment 1 and neuroendocrine tumor on pancreas tail. I plan to perform laparoscopic liver resection and laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy with a BP surgeon. In MRI and CT scan, you can see the tumor compressing the IBC. As an option, we put the 3D model into the VR platform. The yellow structure, which is the tumor, is almost embedded in the IVC, so I wanted to make sure if the operation is possible in laparoscopy. This is the 3D printed model of Spiegel's lobe, IVC, tumor, and portal inflow. If you carefully examine the model, this is the IVC, caudate, tumor, IVC, caudate, tumor. It seems that the biggest problem is whether the tumor is invading into the IVC. This is the surgical video of the process. Left liver was mobilized and triangular ligaments were all transected. And lesser omentum was opened when, and we see the caudate lobe, but we don't see the tumor on the surface. Part of the ligament was encircled just in case, and paracaval area of the caudate was detached from the IVC. And after detachment, we started caudate transection on the right side of the duodenal ligament. And as we go up, we do a Pringle maneuver and start the transection from the left side. And during transection, we meet a lot of small uh, hepatic veins and portal vein going into the cardiac lobe. We cut it and go forward. And you can see the tumor beside the IVC. Because the tumor is uh, on the uh, under area of the IVC, we thought the margin will be enough for uh, complete resection. So the tumor was additionally detached from the IVC and the specimen was out 
and Boolean control was done. This is the specimen, and you can see that the printed model, the tumor on the printed model was almost identical to the size, and the caudate that we printed was almost identical. Postoperative findings shows only small fluid collection on distal pancreatectomy site. As I mentioned previously, this is an individualized Y-shaped silicon stent and currently under the process of KFDA approval for the use. And patent on the technologies under the process. We are doing the project with Animedi solution. This is a 3D printed model of the abdominal cavity of LT recipient. This is mainly used in DDLT case with small recipients, mainly female recipient. We use these models in seven cases, five females and two pediatric patients. One patient underwent reduction graft because of the size mismatch. Two patients had the chance not to use a large graft from the male patients and concurrently transplanted a liver with a matched size. This is a case that was used for choosing the donor between mother and father. Based on the 3D printing, both the father and mother were suitable for LT, so we chose father and LT was successful. The baby from this case is even smaller than the previous baby. The mother's liver seem too big and reduction of the graft seems suitable. After liver delivery, graft before reduction was actually big, not fitting both in the 3D printed model and in the actual baby's abdominal cavity. So reduction was performed at the back table and it fit perfectly to the model and also to the baby's abdomen. And LT was completed successfully. This case was done just previously with an idea to use 3D printing as an actual surgical guide. Based on the 3D printed model we constructed using CT or MRI, we can determine the imaginary transection plane. The patient had the tumor on segment 8, anterior sectionectomy was planned. Based on the portal inflow, the line between the right and left, as well as the right anterior and posterior were marked. And a surgical guide with an anchoring plate on the GB fossa was designed. So this is the 3D printed model. You can see it was well done. During operation, the surgical guide was wrapped in a sterile ball bag and the anchoring plate was placed on the GB fossa. We marked the line with the surgical guide and planned for transection. You can see the similarity between the 3D model and the planned transection line marked on the liver surface. During operation, we palpated the tumor and put the line a little toward the left for margin safety and the line between the right anterior and posterior were similar to the preoperatively marked line with just little differences. This is the final view and you can see the tumor right here. Our research team has expanded the use of 3D printing in various fields of liver surgery, vascular, biliary structure modeling, template model, light version of liver malignancy, patient-specific Y-shaped silicon stent, life version of LT recipients, abdominal cavity, as well as the expected graft liver, and direct surgical guide for hepatectomy. Application of 3D printing in minimal invasive liver surgery can be expanded by creative ideas and effort. Although highly trained surgeons might not feel the need for using 3D printing technology, it can be a useful tool for the surgeon in their learning curve both by understanding the anatomical structure during minimal invasive surgery and by applying surgical guides directly on the liver in the near future. So, will 3D printing become hope for the new surgeons and patients? I think in usefulness, in the pre present setting, 3D printing and minimal invasive surgery is limited to preoperative planning. Expansion of the use during operation needs more effort of the surgeon and engineer and also approval as a medical device. If the process of 3D modeling and printing became more automated, faster, and cheaper, it may be more popular in the near future. Thank you, Professor Liu, for the, your beautiful ex, uh, experience of 3D printing in the liver surgery. So, um, uh, as a title of this uh, um, 
the, your lecture as a 3D printing uh, as a hype or hope. So uh, as you mentioned about the um, uh, hype uh, in your concrete, hype and hope in your conclusion, so uh, many experienced surgeon does not need to 3D printing before the liver section, 3, 3D printing model. But uh, for the young surgeon and uh, um, uh, for the young surgeon uh, need uh, some uh, 3D printing before the, uh, uh, for the uh, pre-operative surgical planning. So uh, uh, we consider about the cost effectiveness uh, when you do the, some new, uh, uh, you adapt the new uh, uh, technology. So uh, 3D printing model is a little bit, it's a, not a little bit, it's so expensive. Uh, what do you think about uh, your 3D printing model uh, up implied to the uh, liver surgery uh, uh, as a, um, to con uh, consider uh, as a uh, cost effectiveness? Uh, uh, I think uh, when we discuss the uh, cost effectiveness of 3D printing, well, it's not that uh, it's not that cost effective <laughs> because uh, in our lab we have uh, uh, one engineer we uh, who's employed full time, and we yeah. have a 3D printer. So uh, actually, we don't uh, need a lot of money to print each model, but we, uh, we have to pay for the uh, engineer. So th that is uh, that can be uh, expensive for some persons who don't have uh, the facility. But um, eventually I think uh, the 3D printing companies that are trying to make medical devices, they might uh, find a way to uh, make the process more easier and uh, eventually, the uh, medical insurance should cover the new technologies. But uh, in cases for uh, experienced surgeons, they might, uh, they will feel that they don't need this. But for uh, beginners, I think there are more uh, room for doing the doing this kind of research. Yeah, actually, uh, if the 3D printing technology is more popular and the cost is less than, uh, less than um, the cost is uh, decreased, uh, this 3D printing uh, technology will be adapted in soon and uh, will be available, will be uh, useful uh, for, to explain the patient and uh, uh, to um, teach it to educate the beginner. Yeah. Also, you in your background, you have a lot of 3D printing uh, materials, uh, products, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we are a little bit behind the schedule. Thank you for your nice, beautiful experience of 3D printing in liver surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you for the compliment. Yes. Uh, last two uh, titles will be moderated by Professor Chiyong Chang. Chiyong, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next topic is uh, how to set up from uh, laparoscopic wet resection to living donor hepatectomy. The speaker is uh, Chan Woo Cho. He is a graduate uh, Gyeongbuk National University School of Medicine in 2010 and uh, uh, from 2015 to 2018. Uh, he, uh, is, he was working clinical fellowship in Samsung Medical Center. Uh, from 2018, uh, he is uh, working in Gyeong Gyeongnam University College of Medicine. Uh, the video clip uh, start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chan Ojo from Gyeongnam University Medical Center, Daegu in Korea. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you my experience of laparoscopic liver resection. In this time, I would like to talk about how to set up from laparoscopic wedge resection to living donor hepatectomy. I have nothing to declare. For successful setup of laparoscopic liver resection, I think these following factors were needed. 
such as patient selection, surgical instrument preparation and team mastery, standardization of interoperative procedures, establishment of postoperative care, and surgeon's factors. In this presentation, I focused on surgeon's factor to overcome the learning curve on a fellowship-trained surgeon's perspectives. So who is fellowship-trained surgeon? There are some definitions of surgeon's role, such as pioneer and early adopter in the ideal paradigm. Fellowship-trained surgeons were defined as the surgeons, like early adopters, who have received the specific training in stage three, but they didn't have prior independent operative experience in hepatobiliary surgery, like me. I'd like to answer these two following questions. First one is, how can a fellowship trained surgeon overcome the learning curve from a beginner's point of view? Second one is, how can an experienced surgeon help fellowship trained surgeons perform laparoscopic liver resection well in terms of the teacher or proctor? There are a couple of cases to overcome the learning curve according to the previous study. Left lateral sectionectomies, 15 to 20 cases, minor, ca minor resections, 25 to 60 cases, and major hepatectomies, 45 to 70 cases. Left lateral sectionectomy for liver donation was 25 cases. But as you know, it was proven that learning curve could be reduced under the guidance of expert. Due to the nature of this presentation topic, I ask for your understanding to tell you my experience. In my case, as a fellowship trained surgeon, there are two important factors to set up from laparoscopy wedge resection to living donor hepatectomy. First one is early leading experience of laparoscopy liver resection in my present hospital, Yongnam University Medical Center. Second one is intensive fellowship training course for me or a young liver surgeon in my previous hospital, Samsung Medical Center. Yongnam University Medical Center had early leading experience of laparoscopic liver resection starting in 2003. Surgical instrument well prepared, surgical team mastery already achieved before I came here so I can perform laparoscopic liver resection as I learned at previous hospital. Samsung Medical Center had intensive fellowship training course for liver surgery and liver transplantation. This is my fellowship program, especially in third year of fellowship. I had a proctorcy for liver surgery and transplantation. I would say that all my learning about laparoscopic liver resection took place over this one year. The SMC proctorship had the following characteristics. Firstly, it is a simultaneous exposure of open and laparoscopic liver resection. It's not a stepwise approach. Secondly, surgical procedures of laparoscopic liver resection were broken down in steps, and a fellowship trained surgeon can perform gradually step by step. Next, there was multiple review using recorded surgical videos. And lastly, I think more most important one, in surgical field, a fellowship trained surgeon had comprehensive interaction with the expert through cognitive task analysis. I'd like to speak more in detail. This is my simple video of laparoscopy wedge resection. Simultaneous exposure of both open and laparoscopy liver resection enables early exposure of laparoscopy liver section. Fellowship trained surgeon can learn how to use CUSA for pharynchymal dissection in the open liver section first. In laparoscopy liver section, they can apply similar dissection technique with open liver section by using CUSA. Like this video on the right, they can use ultrasonic energy device. Surgical procedures should be broken down in steps. For example, this laparoscopic light hepatectomy procedure were divided in the following six steps. Fellowship trained surgeon have to be skilled at performing each step within 30 minutes. 
Actually, proctorship was applied gradually step by step from easier and less important step. For example, if fellowship trained surgeon performed step six without any problem, he could be authorized to do the next step, in this case, step one. In this way, fellowship trained surgeon can have the ability to do more complex and important procedures. To speed up learning process, multiple review using recorded surgical video is needed. Trained surgeon continue to evaluate themselves using recorded surgical video until improving to the level of the proctors like this. The most important role of the proctor is to do surgical education through cognitive task analysis. It's called CTA. CTA is defined as the process by which expert knowledge is imparted to trainee by experienced surgeons. CTA does not include only technical aspect of surgical training, it's focused on the mental learning of steps. In hepatobiliary surgery, there is a report that CTA may help surgeon in training to understand the mental obstruction of experienced surgeons to choose the most appropriate surgical strategy, effective at will, and to minimize the gap. In my proctorship, I was repressed by the proctors in the following situations, such as major vessel bleeding that cause hemodynamic instability, poor surgical progression with excess, excessive operation time than expected, and misunderstanding of liver anatomy during parenchymal dissection. And lastly, weakened mentality for the fellowship trained surgeon to continue the operation. Through operator change, the fellowship trained surgeon can take a step back and watch how to solve these problems. In other words, proctorship in laparoscopic liver resection is like the marathon with a pacemaker in terms of letting you go where you can't go. I'd like to talk about laparoscopic donor hepatectomy that has never been received proctorship in my case. This is a step-by-step -step surgical procedures of laparoscopic living donor light hepatectomy in my previous hospital. Except for light bile duct transection, it has a similar procedure to laparoscopic light hepatectomy. This is my video of light hepatic duct transaction in laparoscopic donor light hepatectomy. Light hepatic artery and portal vein were isolated. In this case, the patient had dual light hepatic artery. Light hepatic duct was isolated. Light hepatic duct anterior wall offering was done. Check light hepatic duct anterior and posterior duct and check posterior wall. Hepatic duct posterior wall was divided. and remnant Grisonian tissue was divided by surgical cleaves. From April 2019 to December 2020, I performed seven laparoscopic donor hepatectomy, donor ages from 19 to 65. Except for one case of light posterior section, all grafts were light hemi livers. Except for transient bile there was no complication in six liver donor. Graft retubular time was not associated with graft weight. The number of cases small, but graft retubular time seems to be flattening to about 300 minutes. 
In the middle of seven donors, I'd like to show the video of pure laparoscopic donor light posterior sectionectomy. 19-year-old male donor has type 3 polar vein. Based on CD volumetry, remnant left liver volume was 27.8% of whole liver volume. So we'll perform the light posterior sectionectomy for liver donation. This is our standardized position. Heparoduodenal ligament and rubella circus dissected. Light posterior hepatic artery and light posterior polar vein were identified and then temporarily clamped. Check the transaction plane demarcate on the liver surface. The parenchymal transection was initially performed the ultrasonic dissection device. Tributary of segment 5 from middle hepatic vein was divided. Segment to 8 glisson from light anterior pedicle was divided. Tributary of segment 8 from middle hepatic vein was divided. Cusa used to minimize the injury of bile duct. Light posterior hepatic artery encircled and light posterior polar vein was identified. Both of two was encircled. We are retracting the vessel loop to the caudal side. Light posterior hepatic duct was identified and encircled. Light posterior hepatic duct was divided with a scissor at the confluence level of light hepatic duct. The remnant hepatic duct stump was closed with hemorrhoid. Codate law of transaction was complete. And parenchymal transaction was complete. Light hepatic vein was encircled. And then light imperial hepatic vein was encircled with the nylon tape. IBC ligament was divided with the surgical stapler. The graft was put into the endoscopic pouch. Light posterior hepatic artery was divided. And light posterior polar vein was divided with the hemorrhoid. Light imperial hepatic vein were transected. 
and right hepatic vein were transected by unilateral linear stapler. The graft was promptly delivered through a prepond incision. Cholestectomy was complete. Fibrin glue was applied. Three months later, on follow-up CT, any specific problem was not detected. In summary of my presentation, proctoship can shorten the learning curve and increase safety in laparoscopic liver section. Standardized operations should be broken down in step. Some steps could be performed by the fellowship trained surgeon himself. Multiple reviews of surgical video can speed up the learning process and shorten the gap between the expert and young surgeon. Cognitive task analysis may help young surgeons in training to understand the mental abstraction of experienced surgeons to make the appropriate surgical decision. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jo. Uh, I have one question. Uh, yes. You are the uh, fellowship trained surgeon. Yes, right. <laughs> so uh, did you explain the uh, uh, short term uh, your learning curve? Yes. Uh, uh, trained, uh, fellowship trained surgeon. Uh, stage three ideal program you uh, experience and then you, the very uh, nice and ex expert liver surgeon. Uh, did you uh, did you experience uh, decrease uh, learning curve through the uh, this program? Yes, as I am, uh, thank you for your uh, your question. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at my presentation. Uh, uh, the most important thing is uh, expert uh, operation uh, should be standardized and the only then we can learn through this operation. Uh, this operation should be broken down in steps and a fellowship uh, trained surgeon can be step by step uh, gradually approaching. Uh, so uh, second one is uh, we we have a uh, multiple uh, surgical video review yeah. and okay. then uh, lastly protocip uh, through cognitive task analysis help to build up the courage to performing uh, laparoscopic liver section by myself okay okay uh, uh, thank you for your nice presentation and th uh, thank you your uh, uh, also, you performed the uh, CTA program. Yes. And then, uh, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, next topic, uh, next presenter is uh, 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 Bio Luca Aldretti. Uh, uh, he is uh, the uh, uh, director of the hepatobiliary surgeon division of uh, uh, San Rafael. Uh, hospital and the associate professor of surgery of Vita uh, Salud University, uh, Milan, Italy. Uh, at present, he is a president of uh, Italian Association of HVP Surgery and also a uh, scientific uh, director of Italian group of minimally invasive liver surgery. Uh, his topic is implantation and diffuse and innovation in minimal invasive liver surgery. Uh, and the video clip, please start. I want to, uh, to thank uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the president and the organizing committee for this uh, uh, very kind uh, uh, 
uh, invitation to this uh, prestigious uh, Congress. I'm really honored of it. Uh, the topic of my presentation is implementation, diffusion, and innovation in minimally invasive uh, liver surgery. Uh, so first of all, what about the diffusion? Um, uh, during the last uh, 30 years, uh, we have been assisting to a uh, uh, vertical spreading uh, uh, throughout the world of uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, liver surgery. This is the number of published uh, uh, paper and as you can see how the, the trend uh, uh, is uh, clearly demonstrating uh, that uh, minimal invasive uh, liver surgery is uh, here to stay. And, uh, you can see here um, some, some papers uh, showing um, uh, this diffusion, uh, a paper from, from Syria uh, considering uh, uh, 9,000 um, uh, liver um, uh, resection performed by minimal invasive surgery and uh, here two papers one, one from US one from Japan both showing um, a large uh, diffusion of uh, minimal invasive liver surgery in Italy we saw the same trend here is uh, the data here are the data from from the Italian uh, uh, registry, um, uh, many centers, obviously different numbers, but the trend uh, concerning uh, the enrollment of uh, cases uh, is uh, clear, uh, is increasing uh, uh, since 2014 and now we have more than 5,000 uh, patients uh, enrolled uh, in the registry. Uh, a picture from, from my center, uh, San Rafael Hospital in Milan, uh, out of a little bit more than 3,500 liver resection, almost 1,400 are done by laparoscopy. And here you can see uh, the trend and the numbers of uh, laparoscopic resection is the green line. Um, the, the, the red line is the line of open liver resection. The blue line is the total number of uh, uh, liver resection. So uh, presently uh, we are doing the almost two thirds of um, a resection by minimally invasive approach. Here is the picture of this year. Uh, half of the resection are done by laparoscopy, one third uh, uh, by open approach, uh, and almost 20% uh, are done by, uh, by the robot. Um, so, uh, um, minimal liver surgery is here to stay. And we have data about the clear advantages of uh, uh, this uh, uh, approach. For example, here, uh, the advantages um, in, in hepatocellular carcinoma, especially we will see again later on this concept in the intermediate stage where um, um, minimal invasive surgery is uh, clearly giving advantages uh, when compared with, with the open approach. Um, uh, also in a colorectal liver metastasis, there is a role for minimal invasive approach. Here is a, a paper from, uh, from uh, uh, my group um, analyzing uh, with the propensity score matching open and lab approach for colorectal liver mets uh, with the clear advantages in terms of blood loss, morbidity, uh, total transfusions, and uh, length uh, of stay. And
even in the field of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, there is a role for minimal invasive um, uh, liver surgery. Um, here you can see how the lymphadenectomy, which is uh, the real crucial point uh, in this type of surgery, can be performed by, by laparoscopy with actually an, uh, advantages uh, over open approach in terms of retrieved nodes uh, and in terms of uh, blood losses, uh, functional recovery and length of stay. Um, the the uh, application of minimal invasive surgery is so clear that now there is a role even in the field of living donation. Here is a Korean paper showing advantages of laparoscopic donor hepatectomy. Uh, and uh, here is a, a multi-institutional paper, including uh, Western and Eastern uh, centers, uh, giving the same message. Uh, there is uh, advantages to perform um, uh, a laparoscopic uh, uh, donor hepatectomy for uh, living donation. Now, which are the key points to uh, further uh, implement uh, the area of minimal invasive liver surgery? Training opportunities, benefits from surgical communities, continuous learning curve, creation of personal ideal setting, and finally, the acceptance of failure. We will quickly address uh, at this point. There are nowadays many training opportunities uh, for, uh, um, for learning uh, how to perform uh, uh, minimal invasive liver resections, live surgery events, uh, where um, uh, it's possible to see surgery performed by masters, mentorship, where surgery is performed by the trainee with the master supervision in the training center, uh, proctorship, where surgery is performed by a local surgeon with master supervision. And finally, um, uh, there should be a, a, a place also for specific school of laparoscopic uh, uh, liver surgery. We have uh, um, this type of school in Italy. There are um, um, other schools uh, around in the world. Uh, this is really important to give not only the technical um, training, uh, but also all the cultural knowledge uh, in this uh, uh, field. Obviously, um, uh, it's important uh, to enter in, in uh, a surgical community that is dedicated uh, to the minimal invasive liver surgery. There are many opportunities uh, uh, probably the most important uh, is the International Laparoscopic Liver Society, uh, whose main mission is to facilitate the diffusion and education of laparoscopic liver resection for meaning meaningful improvements in patient care. And um, we are keen to see uh, and participate uh, to the third World Congress of this uh, society that is going to be held uh, uh, web uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in June. So please uh, connect uh, to this event. Uh, it's important uh, to uh, implement any program of minimally invasive liver surgery, keeping a wise approach uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the learning curve. And it's important to be aware that the learning curve is not short. At least uh, uh, this is my experience. A couple of years ago, I reviewed my personal experience in uh, um, 1000 um, laparoscopic liver resection. And uh, here is the picture. Uh, almost 100 cases are needed to complete the learning curve. 60 cases for low complexity, uh, 15 cases for intermediate uh, complexity, and other 15 cases for high 
complexity. Um, so please be aware that um, it's important to take time to learn um, in a wise way uh, the uh, minimal invasive uh, liver resections. Uh, it is no more the time uh, to take a small uh, technology uh, in, in the operatory room uh, uh, for uh, just um, uh, one case uh, of uh, uh, minimal invasive uh, liver resection is important to create a real um, setting uh, uh, in the operatory room uh, for a program of uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, or robotic resection. The, the, here is how our operatory room appears. Uh, for laparoscopic resections uh, with the 4K technology. And here is uh, a team picture with our new friend uh, that is the robot. When uh, implementing uh, uh, the uh, laparoscopic uh, liver program, um, the, the problem of uh, conversion need to be addressed. And um, uh, there is no uh, no way to avoid it. Conversion is uh, still uh, uh, present uh, in uh, in uh, in our activity, and here, obviously, we don't have any more a twenty percent conversion rate that was in the learning curve period. But we have uh, uh, still a conversion rate ranging between 13% and 14% in this implementation period. I will address the point of some fields of innovation and I would consider three areas, technical and technological advantages advances to overcome uh, some uh, limitations in the area of minimal invasive liver surgery, the awareness of uh, uh, the benefit of minimal invasive liver surgery with the possibility to widen the uh, indications for such a type of surgery. And finally, uh, it's uh, the uh, the time now to define the uh, the benchmarks of the surgery and what I call the differential benefit, which is uh, when uh, there is a real advantage of minimal invasive surgery um, when uh, compared to open surgery. About the first point. Uh, uh, I uh, think that uh, Indochanin Green is a, a, a real uh, um, innovation in, in, in the area of minimal invasive liver surgery. Uh, with the Indochanin Green, we can really perform uh, Indochanin guided uh, liver resection with the possibility, especially, to perform anatomical resection looking at the staining into the liver and not only on the surface of the liver like it was traditionally done. So I think this is going to become a real standard in our surgery, at least in anatomical resection. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of interest around uh, the area of augmented reality. It's a really a, a wide area. Uh, I think it's really difficult to say uh, if uh, uh, we are um, at the point or there is the need of uh, more um, uh, implementation in this area. Uh, I think there is a big problem that is uh, uh, the, um, um, the, the position of the liver um, uh, while performing uh, a, a resection that makes uh, everything difficult uh, um, when applying uh, a reconstruction 
created uh, on uh, uh, the preoperative imaging. But uh, definitely, uh, this is uh, uh, a, a, a field of uh, of uh, um, implementation in the near uh, in the near future. There is obviously the the, the question concerning uh, uh, the robot. Um, uh, I'm pretty confident with the fact that um, the robot um, uh, will have uh, a, a clear future in the area of minimally invasive uh, liver surgery. Uh, there is the problem of the cost. There are some problems with uh, uh, the instruments, but the definitely um, the robot uh, is helping uh, uh, the surgeon uh, performing uh, uh, liver resections. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, apply uh, minimal liver surgery in some specific areas where surgery was supposed to be forbidden. Uh, a typical example is uh, the area of the child B patients uh, in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, uh, minimal invasive liver surgery is given uh, the surgeons the possibility to operate uh, uh, these patients. Uh, one paper uh, from a multi-institutional uh, group and another paper here. So there are evidences uh, of the possibility to perform uh, a minimal invasive um, uh, liver resection in child B uh, patients. Um, and it's important uh, uh, to apply minimal invasive surgery also in the reduced surgery. Uh, this is uh, definitely an area um, of application in the field of colorectal liver metastasis, uh, but also in the area of HCC. Re reduce surgery by laparoscopy um, is uh, an important uh, field. As far as concern uh, um, uh, widening the indication, periyalar cholangiocarcinoma uh, is definitely an area of application. Here is our first experience. Uh, with the application of the of the robot, I think uh, results will be even even better. And finally, uh, uh, very complex procedures like two stage hepatectomy and ALPR procedure. But what is more important is uh, the definition of the benchmarks um, in minimal invasive liver surgery. Uh, here is an experience from our IGOMES group in Italy defining benchmarks according to complexity of minimal invasive resections, uh, um, uh, morbidity benchmark ranging from 80% to 26% according to the low or high complexity and the major morbidity from 1.5 to 6%. Um, I will close my presentation uh, addressing a, a crucial point. When is more important to apply a minimal invasive uh, uh, surgery? Uh, um, yeah, for example, as far as concerns uh, the topography, um, uh, the, 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 the greater advantage of laparoscopy is in the area of posterior superior segments. Not, not in the anterolateral uh, resections, despite uh, the, the more demanding uh, um, uh, surgery. So we should apply minimal invasion for uh, uh, this type of operation. And here is another paper, uh, according to complexity, again, the greater advantage is for resection that have a high profile of complexity if, if performed by laparoscopy. For example, here you can see that we have more advantages uh, for um, uh, um, resections uh, in uh, the area of the right hepatectomy when compared to the hepatectomy. And uh, uh, finally, 
uh, when uh, uh, the more the patient is fragile, the more the laparoscopic resection is important. Uh, uh, ACC, more advantages uh, in the area of intermediate group and not in the early group. So here is the, 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 the picture. I think this is interesting. Uh, we have a, a wider benefit in posterior superior segments in high complexity cases and in more complex patients. So it's important that any minimal invasive liver surgery program uh, address uh, this type of procedures and patients, even if uh, uh, is definitely more demanding. My conclusions are that hepatobiliary surgeons have to promote the implementations of minimal invasive liver surgery, learning and facing a complex procedure to, key, to give the patient the best benefit. Many issues are still on the table and hopefully will be addressed in the future, but please to avoid the wrong predictions uh, it's better to say that minimally invasive liver surgery is here to stay and the future is still to be written. Thanks for uh, your attention and thanks again for inviting me to this uh, prestigious event. Uh, thank you, uh, Aldrete. Are you there? Yes. Uh, Aldrete, uh, uh, okay. yes, yes, uh, correct. correct. Uh, good morning in Milan. <laughs> uh, yes, nice yes, I'm in Milan. Yeah, I'm very uh, impressed for your uh, innovation and the, uh, congratulations uh, your remarkable report, uh, Italian group, uh, Mills. Uh, very uh, nice uh, report. And uh, I have one question in your Italian registry. Uh, do, uh, do you uh, perform the education or a feedback program? Yes, we have a, we have a, a school, a, a specific school on uh, minimal invasive liver surgery that is uh, 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 combining uh, uh, um, uh, mentorship and proctorship, meaning that uh, the trainees uh, go first to a referral center, start uh, uh, getting trained by, by experienced surgeons. And then there is a second phase where the experienced surgeon uh, move in the operatory room uh, of the, the, the trainee so that uh, uh, can, can proctor directly the operation. Uh, we are also starting now um, with, uh, with uh, the idea to create uh, a web uh, proctorship, but uh, it didn't start uh, yet so far. Okay. Uh, uh, Igo Mills is uh, well uh, established in Italy and uh, congratulations to number of cases and the numeracy of center. Uh, uh, also in Korea, the uh, similar program uh, uh, now going. Uh, in the near future, uh, I will hopefully to see you in Korea. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation, uh, Dr. Aldriti. Uh, thank you thanks. for joining. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. In the future as well. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, we have time limit. We uh, would like to proceed uh, our uh, session and uh, thank you for uh, all participants and uh, uh, speaker. Uh, thank you very much. I will close this session.